Hello, I'm Doug White. Welcome to NBC 10 Biographies. The ability of an artist to entertain and capture our imagination is a cherished gift. In this episode, we will meet two individuals who both possess that unique talent. Don Bosquet has been making us laugh with his own special blend of quirky characters and quahog humor for decades. Ciceretta Jones sang for presidents and kings at the turn of the century before retiring to her home in Providence. We begin this edition of NBC 10 Biographies with Don Bosquet. Don Bosquet was born in Pawtucket on March 17, 1948. His family moved to Richmond when he was seven years old. There, his father, Donald Sr., and his mother, Eleanor, raised a family of seven children. The unique environment that only Rhode Island can provide molded the young artist's childhood. He drew this colorful and imaginative map when he was in the sixth grade. Bosquet attended Cherahoe High School, where his creative abilities continued to blossom. Donald left my class many times with cartoon scraps around the top of the desk or on the floor. Or... He was voted most artistic in his class and left a lasting impression on some of his teachers. He drew a picture of me. Um, I used to part my hair in the middle, and that was very odd in those days. And. Um, big nose, and he'd make some type of a remark at the bottom of it, uh, guess who? After graduating from high school, Don Bosquet was drafted. He joined the Navy and was trained as a photographer. The future funny man anxiously awaited his first mission. Bosquet was handed a tough assignment. He would have to photograph a beauty pageant. A greater challenge came in 1969 when it was his responsibility to develop and print some of the first photographs taken on the moon. After he completed his tour with the Navy, Bosquet married his high school sweetheart, Laura Partello. He put his creative talents on hold and got a job working for the Pinkerton Detective Agency. Later, Bosquet enrolled at the University of Rhode Island. Much to his surprise, he got a C in his art course. He promptly switched his major to anthropology. After graduation, Bosquet worked as a vocational counselor. For six long years, he put on a suit and drove to a job that paid the bills, but left him feeling unsatisfied. Finally, in 1980, Bosquet decided to follow his dream. He quit his job and raced home to tell his wife he wanted to be a cartoonist. Laura Bosquet listened patiently to her husband's enthusiastic plan. Then she announced her good news. She was pregnant. Don Bosquet was about to become a cartoonist and a father. NBC 10 Biographies will continue in a moment. After quitting a steady job to pursue his dream, Don Pasquet spent months drawing sophisticated cartoons and submitting them to the New Yorker magazine. All were rejected. Turning to what he knew best, Pasquet started drawing cartoons with local themes and submitting them to regional publications. After months of effort, he sold his first cartoon to Rhode Island Magazine. He was paid the grand and glorious sum of $10. It wasn't much money, but it was a start. Soon, the Providence Journal, Yankee Magazine, and Reader's Digest were featuring his work. He published the first book, uh, Beware of the Quahog. I said to him, I think this is going to go into a second printing. Well, I was a little, little less than clairvoyant in that respect. Uh, it turned out we did six printings of that book, and it sold very well. What's the secret of his success? Bosquet would be the first to admit that he owes a lot to one of the most humble residents of Narragansett Bay, the Quahog. 
an important part of the local economy and the official state shell, these mighty mollusks have provided plenty of laughs for the Ocean State's most popular cartoonist. He uh, has a very uh, wide sense of humor, and he, he uh, is very perceptive. And he sees the humor in a lot of situations, and he doesn't take himself that seriously or life that seriously. Throughout his career, Don Bosque has displayed an uncanny knack for capturing the quirky characters and out-of-the-ordinary events that make life in Little Rhodey so unique. I'd call him a regional cartoonist. I think he's something, it's, you know, it's unique in my experience. I don't know of anybody that does what he does in the United States. Uh, he's a guy that lives here, came from here, and makes fun of us. You know, and makes us look at ourselves and, and, and enjoys us. If you spend any time away from here and you come back, huh, you feel like you're home again because people talk like this. There's this lady on the phone and she's saying, So I go to this party when I'm visiting my sister in California, right? And this cute guy, he says, Betcha I know where you come from. So not for nothing, I says, No way. And the guy says, Way. Then he says, Rhode Island, right? I tell you, Brenda, it was unbelievable. I mean, that guy, he must be real smart. He's immortalized our obsession with license plates. And he has illustrated our fascination with New England's tempestuous and unpredictable weather. Bosque knows how to make us laugh. Sometimes it's the steamy reputation of a local nude beach or the allure of a nearby casino. Everything else in this comic section you can get in any newspaper in the United States. Don Busque is what's unique about it. Cartooning has provided a natural outlet for some of Bosque's pet peeves, like those pesky potholes that seem to plague our highways. And he's taken aim at the not-so-friendly folks you can sometimes run into at the Registry of Motor Vehicles. Since the earliest days of the Republic, cartoons have been used both to entertain and to express opinions. Those targeted by these pen and ink punchlines have not always appreciated the joke. Over the years, anti-cartoon legislation has been proposed in New York, California, Indiana, and Alabama. Fortunately, the right of free expression has always prevailed. Don Bosque's humor is decidedly good-natured, but some of his gags have ruffled a few feathers. Well, your favorite ones are always the ones where he's kind of zinging you. Woonsocket was once the home of many French-Canadian immigrants. Their culture, accents, and speech patterns were sometimes the object of jokes or ridicule. Some residents were deeply offended when Bosque incorporated such material into his work. And the nearby city of Fall River, Massachusetts was not amused when a pair of Bosque's cartoon astronauts decided to name a barren, lifeless planet New Fall River. <laughs> the delegation came in from Fall River and they're saying, we're trying to rebuild this city and you're doing this to us. And uh, Don got banished in the journal. He was sent to uh, a journal closet for a while by the then publisher and uh, was resurrected later. But perhaps the biggest outcry came when Don Bosque set his sights on Federal Hill. In the 1960s, Federal Hill had the dubious distinction of being the neighborhood that New England crime boss Raymond Patriarca chose for his headquarters. Patriarca died decades ago, and the city has made great strides to improve both the look and the reputation of Federal Hill. When the Providence Journal published a cartoon by Bosque that poked fun at the neighborhood's darker days, it ignited a firestorm of protest. There are those of us who try to bring a community together 
and then there's people like him who try to divide it. Not very talented, but what do you expect? But those who know Don best say he doesn't have a mean bone in his body. My take on it is Don Bosquet as a person is one of the gentlest people you'll encounter. <laughs> he is really, he's trying to have gentle fun with people. His cartoons were meant for you to enjoy a good chuckle. If it did offend you, then there's something wrong with you, I think. And he's well known for his efforts on behalf of nonprofit and charitable organizations. He's done virtually every charity you can think of in the community. What he's done is also offered cartoons and originals for sale or auction. And it's raised a lot, a lot of money. Very, very kind-hearted and almost never says no. Bosquet has sold hundreds of thousands of copies of his work and has just finished his 18th book. Success hasn't gone to his head. I think he hasn't changed one iota from the first time I met him. Let's go for a ride. My way. Bosquet's lifelong study of the Rhode Island experience, played out by his portly banana nose characters, has enriched all our lives. Young man, I'll see you after school tonight. When I grow up, I want to be Don Bosquet. He loves to drive past. <laughs> and Don Bosquet shows no sign of slowing down. The Extraordinary Life of Ciceretta Jones, next on NBC10 Biographies. Ciceretta Jones was born in 1869 in Virginia and moved to Providence when she was seven years old. She sang in her church choir as a child with the voice of an angel. When she was 15, she enrolled at the Providence Academy of Music and continued her education at music schools in Boston. Ciceretta's incredible talent as an opera singer was soon recognized. She was hired for a tour of South America and the West Indies. That's inspiring, you know, when you think about back then how difficult it had to be to try and be an opera singer. And she still did it. Her husband, Richard Jones, handled her career. A flamboyant gambler, he reportedly lit his cigars with $10 bills. I think he had both a positive and a negative effect, but he was definitely a hustler. And he hustled her, in a sense. Uh, he realized that he was had commodity that was extraordinary and in a sense rare. It was very difficult for women, uh, black women, to gain access to that kind of training, to gain access to the worlds that she was able to be a part of. Jones took Ciceretta to London for what were called arsenic treatments to lighten her skin and straighten her hair. Black women were perceived um, in the darker they were, the more uh, they were relegated to more domestic service. Um, if I can be so blunt. Uh, and so by in fact lightening her skin, they, he was trying to make her more acceptable to audiences. Ciceretta Jones toured Europe, performed for the Prince of Wales and three presidents, including Theodore Roosevelt. In one week at Madison Square Garden, she sang before 75,000 people. She was the first black performer to play Carnegie Hall. The New York Review called her the most gifted singer the age has produced. This would be something that she would wear in her performances. And if you can take a, a little closer look here at some of the details at the bottom, you know, it, it's the kind of a, a outfit that a woman would, would wear and make a grand entrance in. Ciceretta was named the Black Patty by newspapers, comparing her to the world-famous Italian soprano Adelina Patti. She grew to resent the comparison because it meant she would never be accepted for her own talent and accomplishments. It was both derogatory and disturbing to her, but that was how she built up her reputation. So when Miss Black Patty was uh, relegated to doing minstrel shows, uh, it must have been devastating to her psyche. Uh, but it was difficult to get rid of the name because that was how her reputation was based here in this country. Madam Ciceretta Jones often performed wearing the medals she had received from countries where her singing had enchanted both audiences and heads of state. There was talk of casting her in Aida, but black performers were not allowed to perform at the Metropolitan Opera House. When she was singing opera, it was unheard of really that 
quote, Negroes could sing opera because they were expected to sing coon songs and spirituals and things like that. So it was as rare as a Tiger Woods taking the golf world by storm. Beginning in 1895, Ciceretta led a tour group of singers and musicians called the Black Patty Troubadours. Madam Ciceretta Jones, this is her company. Black Patty's Troubadours, America's premier ragtime entertainers. No matter what she sings, when you first hear her voice, it makes you want to cry. It hasn't been easy for her. Not that it's easy for anyone of color, of course. But Ciceretta hasn't forgotten who she is or where she came from. She has given dozens of black performers their first chance, and she came from right here in Providence. This was an era when white audiences were bombarded by entertainment that depicted blacks as foolish, cowardly, and lazy. Racial stereotypes became staple ingredients of American culture. Hundreds of popular songs reinforced that image. The historical implications of the so-called minstrel shows are the subject of a current movie by the controversial black director, Spike Lee. The new millennium minstrel show. We're gonna need a little more money for this. This could be bigger than Friends, Ally McBeal, even my boys Amos and Andy. Damn. You're putting white actors in black face? We're using black actors with blacker faces. <laughs> The minstrel shows were an exaggeration of what blackness was. The blackened face with the red lips and the exaggeration and the eyes and, and um, twitching and particular movements that were there to reinforce the place where blacks were allowed. For black individuals, there's a lot of shame in being forced to portray oneself and one's identity that way. Um, as limiting as those opportunities were, if this was the only entree, many people took them. Like many African-American artists, the Black Patty Troubadour is catered to popular tastes. She had to appeal to the masses to make a living for 19 years that she led that group. She had to make a living, and sometimes artists sell out in order to make a living. I mean, what the heck, she died penniless despite it all. But Ciceretta included some of the show tunes and selections from opera that had made her famous. She wasn't stripped of all her dignity, even performing in the, in the minstrel shows. She knew that, that, there, that she was expected to sing, you know, just uh, Negro spirituals and those kinds of songs and, and decided to, to break the pattern. Sometimes to achieve greatness, we have to go up against what's expected. After 20 successful years, the group broke up in 1915. Ciceretta returned to Providence to care for her mother and grandmother. As her fame quickly faded from the public memory, Ciceretta was forced to sell her property, jewelry, and mementos to survive. She eventually took a job as a cook, receiving the meager pay afforded a black woman in those days. At the end of her life, uh, she was basically working as a domestic. So all she had left was the stories and the memories that she had. Here you have someone in the company of such great and powerful people who at the very end of her life is penniless and she dies of cancer. And that same cancer I would really like to say is a metaphor for the illness that this country suffers from, racism. Madam Ciceretta Jones died alone and all but forgotten in July of 1933. Donations from friends saved her from being buried in an unmarked grave. A review once said that her voice told not only of the sorrows of a single life, but the cruelly sad story of a whole people. I think we can learn a lot of things from her life. One, that race doesn't determine talent. That intelligence, creativity, takes many forms. And that even well-educated audiences I'm not always enlightened. NBC 10 Biographies will continue after these messages. Thank you for being with us. 
I'm Doug White. Be sure to join us next time for another edition of NBC 10 Biographies.